Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I also rise to speak to Amendment 89 and the other amendments listed in my name and the name of my colleagues. Part one of this bill introduces two key trade mechanisms within the UK for the first time, mutual recognition and non-discrimination. The member for North East Derbyshire tries to make these sound very benign, but I would say that just shows his lack of ability to see what they look like from any of the devolved nations. Non-discrimination, which is covered in clauses 5 and 6, would affect labelling regarding the source of produce and therefore remove the ability from consumers to reduce their food miles or support local producers if they choose, or be used to undermine or challenge protected geographical indicators or the Scottish brand, as in Scotch whisky and Scotch beef. Despite their long tradition and international recognition as Scottish products, we already see the promotion of British whisky and British haggis, of all things. <laughs> Clauses two and three cover mutual recognition, which creates a powerful deregulatory pressure, as if any UK nation has lower standards or regulations, the other three must just shut up and accept such goods. As England is the largest nation and economically the most powerful, it's assumed their standards will dominate, particularly as the Secretary of State has the power to change the bill if he wishes on a whim. While Section 9 says the Secretary of State must consult the devolved nations, I'm afraid the last four years have shown just how worthless and meaningless such a phrase is. Section 4 lists the aspects of a product which could come under mutual recognition, including its characteristics, performance standards, packaging and labelling, certification, and there's even a catch-all line of anything not covered in paragraphs A to F. Basically, every single aspect of commercial goods could be challenged under this legislation. The government claim, as indeed many of the benches opposite do, that this bill is needed to maintain trade across the UK. Yet tr previously, trade continued without any problems, despite the variations in the Four Nations regulation. And all three devolved governments have been working to agree common frameworks to ensure there are no obstacles to trade, but that devolved powers and different priorities of the Four Nations are respected. It's claimed the bill is to pr protect British producers, but clauses two and five also refer to goods which are imported into or pass through any part of the UK. So this isn't about UK producers who already meet high standards. It's clear that despite all the rhetoric and protestations, this is either about lowering UK standards or accepting lower quality products to achieve a trade deal. This concern is heightened by the UK government's repeated refusal in the agriculture or trade bills to protect food standards or exclude the NHS and other public services from future trade deals. Indeed, there's no guarantee of preserving minimum standards on anything. Honourable friend, give way. I will. Honourable friend, for giving way. The Chief agree with me. It tells a huge story that this government have voted against those kinds of protections on ten occasions. I thank my colleague for the intervention, and absolutely, the, the amendment was from one of their own members, a chair of the, the DEFRA committee, who brought forward to protect food standards in farming. <laughs> Thank you, friend. And would my honourable friend join me in my amazement that not a single Scottish Tory has attended this day's debate, despite the impact that these, suggest these uh, proposals are going to have on the devolved nations and on Scotland? Well, I think particularly, you know, I think the Conservatives tend to count on the farming community in Scotland, and I would have to echo what others have said. The National Farmers Union in Scotland is none too happy with what's been happening, and particularly the failure to protect standards. So this, of course, brings us to the dreaded chlorine-washed chicken. Now, of course, it's not the chlorine that's the issue. If you're not a great swimmer, you'll have swallowed more than that in a swimming pool. But the concern is about why the chicken is washed in chlorine in the first place. Due to overcrowding of poultry and poor animal welfare standards, 
the US has between seven and ten times the salmonella food poisoning rate of the UK, even after washing their poultry. And it's quite clear that most consumers are none too keen on chlorine-washed chicken or hormone-fed beef. But the labelling restrictions under this may well mean that they're not allowed to know. A lot of people may consider becoming vegetarian when these kind of products appear. But that actually won't help them, because the US also allows higher pesticide uh, residues. After Clause 46 of this bill, which takes back control of spending in devolved areas, it is the mutual recognition clauses which have the biggest impact on removing powers from the devolved governments. Mutual recognition means any devolved legislation to maintain or drive up standards would end up only applying to local producers and not to goods from elsewhere in the UK. This would, of course, put local producers at a disadvantage without achieving the benefit that the devolved government were seeking. The EU single market is based on mutual recognition. But the EU generally sets higher rather than lower standards. And as was mentioned previously, new standards are agreed by all 27 nations, previously 28. Unlike the UK, the EU accepts derogation for social benefits such as public health, consumer prote protection, waste reduction or tackling climate change. This bill has no such derogations at all. It has often been the devolved nations which have driven ideas and legislation forward in the UK. This should be welcomed, not obstructed. On health, Scotland was the first UK nation to introduce the smoking ban in 2006 and led the way on minimum unit pricing of alcohol in 2018, which Wales is now seeking to follow. But this was specifically attacked as a regulatory restriction in the White Paper and could fall foul of either mutual recognition or non-discrimination. The government don't seem to be very clear. While re legislation that's already in place is exempt, any change to that legislation could bring it within the scope of the bill. So that may act as a disincentive to increasing the unit price on alcohol in the future. And indeed, this whole bill is a disincentive to creative legislation within the devolved governments to improve life for their citizens. On the environment, Wales was the first to charge for carrier bags in all shops in 2011, followed a couple of years later by Northern Ireland and Scotland. England finally followed in 2015, but only for large retailers. Last year, Scotland was the first UK nation to ban plastic stemmed cotton buds, which make up 5 to 10% of marine waste. Yet Scotland's plans for a deposit return scheme to increase recycling and reduce litter is attacked in the white paper. If the devolved nations have to always wait for the slowest, innovation and action will be stifled. Part three of the bill establishes similar new rules over professional qualifications and ironically seems to be mod modelling itself on freedom of movement. Clause 22, section 2 states that anyone recognised as professionally qualified in one part of the UK must be accepted in all other nations of the UK. Of course, medical qualifications like mine are part of a UK-wide registration, but there are professions with specific requirements to be registered in Scotland and Wales. I note that, miraculously, there were still enough lawyers left in the government to make sure this new rule didn't apply to the legal profession, as, of course, Scots law is completely separate. But what about other professions? England has introduced nursing apprentices and nursing associates, while Scotland still maintains nursing as an academic profession. Scotland and Wales both require a teaching qualification, but in England, anyone with a degree can become a teacher without any formal teacher training. Education in Scotland wasn't devolved 20 years ago, but like Scots Law and the Church of Scotland, has been a separate entity since prior to the Act of Union and was protected in that Act. This bill is a piece of wanton vandalism. The Tories never supported devolution 
And this bill is driven by anti-devolution politics and control freakery, rather than anything to do with economics or business. There is an alternative to this high-handed and heavy-handed legislation. The UK government should get back to the table and continue working on agreeing common frameworks, instead of winding back two decades of devolution. Because I can tell members in this House, regardless of their views on independence, the vast majority of people in Scotland support devolution. They appreciate the value of maintaining a unified public NHS and Scotland's well-being policies, from the baby box to free personal care. Last Friday was the sixth anniversary of our independence referendum, when the people of Scotland held control of their future in their own hands for 15 hours, but sadly gave it back. Among the broken promises of Better Together, which achieved that outcome, was vote no to stay in the EU, a promise of more devolution, not less, and that Scotland was an equal partner in a family of nations. This bill leaves any shred of such a claim twisting in the wind. So if the Prime Minister and his government think this bill will strengthen their precious union, I have news for him. It will do precisely the opposite.